Elon Musk recently said on X that a permanently crewed lunar science base would be far more impressive than a repeat of what was already done incredibly well by Apollo in 1969. But why do we suddenly need a base on the moon when we didn't 50 years ago? What's changed? What long-term benefits would a moon base actually bring us? And perhaps most importantly, with all the delays NASA is dealing with in its Artemis program, is it really worth it? That tweet of Elon Musk was actually in response to recent news that NASA might replace SpaceX's Starship with another lunar lander, like Blue Origin's Blue Moon, due to Starship's development delays. But here's the thing. If we're serious about building a long-term base on the moon, we need something with Starship-level capabilities. Yes, Blue Origin may land on the moon first, but they're starting with Blue Moon Mark 1, a relatively small testbed. It's not designed to carry the massive loads needed for construction or long-term habitation. Meanwhile, Starship is built to move serious mass. Its cargo capacity could change everything. With that much volume, we could land not just habitats, but pilot plants, equipment to test how we can extract water, oxygen, and metals directly from the moon's surface. If Starship performs as promised, it could be a true game-changer for in-situ resource utilization. On SpaceX's own site, they say Starship could begin commercial cargo missions to the moon by 2028, with a cost of around $100,000 per kilogram. That's a big deal, because before this, sending just one kilogram to the moon would cost about $1 million. That's a 10 times cost drop, and it's exactly the kind of capability we need to make a moon base actually happen. And if the reason for choosing another company is just to beat China to the moon, let's not forget, China also plans to set up a base there. So this isn't just about planting a flag first, it's about who can actually build and sustain something meaningful over the long term. The idea of building a base on the moon has been around for over 150 years. It started with science fiction, like Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon, 1865, and H.G. Wells' The First Men in the Moon, 1901, which sparked the imagination of future scientists and engineers. In the 1950s, Dr. Werner von Braun helped popularize a vision of space exploration that included space stations, a moon base, and a mission to Mars. This led to the Apollo program and the first human landing on the moon in 1969, driven largely by Cold War competition. Since then, high costs and shifting political priorities have held back plans for a moon base. NASA focused instead on the space shuttle and building the International Space Station, delaying deeper space exploration. As a result, the dream of a lunar base has remained on hold, waiting for the right moment to move forward. But then, back on December 11, 2017, U.S. space policy took a big step forward when Space Policy Directive 1 was signed. In simple terms, it marked a shift toward a more collaborative approach, bringing in private companies to help the U.S. This resulted in the announcement of the Artemis program, also in 2017. Its stated goal is, with Artemis missions, NASA will land the first woman and first person of color on the moon, using innovative technologies to explore more of the lunar surface than ever before. We will collaborate with commercial and international partners and establish the first long-term presence on the moon. Then, we will use what we learn on and around the moon to take the next giant leap, sending the first astronauts to Mars. The basic idea here is pretty straightforward. When it comes to exploring the solar system, the moon makes for a great pit stop. It's not just a symbolic destination, it's actually a smart one. Compared to Earth, it takes about 20 times less energy to launch from the moon. That's because it only has about one-sixth of Earth's gravity and no atmosphere to fight against. So, the thinking goes, if we can get to the moon, set up a refueling station or some kind of base there, it opens up the rest of the solar system in a much more manageable way. The moon becomes a sort of launch pad for deeper space missions, a stepping stone to Mars and beyond. Of course, with all the delays and pressure to speed things up, it's understandable that NASA might be tempted to cut corners or look for quicker solutions. But even in the rush, we can't lose sight of why the moon matters in the first place. It's not just a stop on the way. It's a key that could unlock the rest of the solar system. So let's say we really commit to the idea of building a base at the moon's south pole. Picture something like the International Space Station, just on the lunar surface. A few compact modules, a crew of astronauts living and working there for extended periods, 
and systems to keep them safe and supported. It's an exciting vision, but there's a lot that needs to happen before that can become reality. First off, we need reliable transportation to and from the moon. That includes not just carrying astronauts, but also delivering tons of cargo, equipment, supplies, fuel, you name it. Then there's communication. How do we stay in touch with spacecraft heading to the moon or with the people working on the surface? And once you are on the moon, how do you get power? If I wanted to charge my iPhone up there, how would that even work? There's no plug in the regolith. We're talking about building the equivalent of ports on Earth, places where landers can dock, unload cargo, and launch again, reliably and safely. One big issue is landing. Rocket exhaust kicks up dust, lots of it, and lunar dust is sharp, fast-moving, and dangerous. There's no atmosphere to slow it down, so it blasts out like shrapnel, potentially damaging nearby structures. So, before anything else, we need to lay down proper landing pads and protective infrastructure. That's step one in preventing a moon base from becoming a moon disaster. So far, most of our focus when it comes to the Moon or Mars has been on getting there. The launches, the landings, the rockets. But there hasn't been nearly as much thought put into what happens once people are actually living on the surface for months or even years. That's a problem, because designing a lunar base needs to start by asking, what does daily life on the Moon actually look like? A good lunar base should support regular surface activities, science, exploration, mining, building new systems, and more. And this has to happen in a pretty brutal environment, with rocky terrain, extreme temperatures, and zero atmosphere. It's not just about surviving. It's about setting up systems that allow astronauts to actually live and work there in a sustainable way. Site planning is critical. Every part of the base needs to be in the right place. Some areas, like suit-up stations and exploration zones, need to be close together. Others, like power plants or fuel storage, need to be farther away for safety reasons. For example, if you're using a nuclear power source, you don't want that sitting right next to the crew quarters. NASA has started outlining how all these pieces might fit together. Things like shadows, slopes, and natural landforms on the moon will affect where we can place buildings and equipment. So, the planning process is complex. It involves mapping the terrain, testing different layouts, and adjusting as we learn more, especially about crucial resources like water ice. Even though we've never built anything on the moon, we're not starting from scratch. We've learned a lot from massive construction projects here on Earth. Techniques like Geographic Information Systems, GIS, let us analyze topography and divide land into zones. That approach works just as well on the moon. A full moon base might have zones for landings, cargo handling, repairs, science labs, mining, power systems, living quarters, even greenhouses and recreation spaces. These need to be organized in a way that keeps everything running smoothly, safely, and efficiently. And yes, redundancy matters. Having more than one landing pad, for instance, helps keep things moving if one is damaged or busy. The infrastructure gets even more detailed. Think roads between zones, trenches to carry power and data lines, fuel pipes, radiation shielding, blast walls, the list goes on. Once the site plan is solid, engineers can start identifying every system the base will need, breaking that down into concrete design requirements. Sure, there are still big challenges to building a permanent base on the moon, but there are also plenty of reasons why now, or in the next few years, is actually a great time to do it. For one, the cost of getting to the moon has dropped significantly since the Apollo era. Back in the 1970s, reaching the lunar surface took about 10% of the entire U.S. federal budget. That's a staggering number, especially when adjusted for inflation. Today, NASA is aiming to not only return to the moon, but to establish a long-term presence there at just a tenth of that original cost, or around 1% of the federal budget. This massive drop in cost comes from several technological advances. Take computing power. What used to require rooms of bulky hardware in the Apollo days can now fit in your pocket. In fact, the entire Saturn V rocket and Apollo lander had less computing power than a modern smartphone. 
That matters a lot. We've also made major leaps in material science and manufacturing. Key spacecraft components are cheaper and faster to produce now. There's a thriving commercial supply chain for things like radios, sensors, and star trackers, parts you can now just buy off the shelf instead of custom building everything from scratch. You can see these changes reflected in NASA's current approach. Programs like commercial lunar payload services are tapping private companies to develop lunar landers instead of relying solely on in-house government-built hardware. That's a huge shift in strategy, and it's working. Looking ahead, the goal is to eventually take the human supervisor out of the equation. As we start building bigger and more complex infrastructure, we're definitely going to want things to run longer and more smoothly without constant human oversight. The idea is to move toward more autonomous systems that can be remotely operated from Earth. When it comes to making bricks out of lunar regolith, researchers are adapting and tweaking processes we already use here on Earth. The most straightforward method is to collect the regolith, compact it, and heat it up until it fuses together, a process called sintering. This can be done using something like an oven, concentrated sunlight, microwaves, or even lasers. To make the bricks stronger and easier to work with, scientists are testing ways to refine the materials like filtering out certain particle sizes or mixing in polymers or synthetic binders. NASA is also working on more environmentally friendly alternatives to traditional Portland cement, which is normally used as mortar to hold bricks together. That's a big deal, considering cement production accounts for about 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions every year. Most of the technologies we need to actually build and operate a moon base are still in development. A lot of it is still in the prototype stage, so there's a ton of work that needs to happen here on Earth before we can make any of this real. Luckily, we've been here before. Massive Earth-based projects, airports, industrial complexes, even Antarctica research stations cost billions and follow a pretty standard process. Study, test, design, build, operate, and eventually retire. NASA's systems engineering model works the same way, just adapted for the extreme conditions of space. By combining that proven Earth-based approach with space-specific needs, we can build a realistic, step-by-step -step plan to make a moon base happen. It won't be easy. It might even be one of the hardest things humanity has ever done. But it's definitely not impossible.